Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and today I'm going to deal with picture tests and practical anatomy of the thorax. The video today is about the thoracic wall, lungs, and pleura, part two. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. A needle was introduced to drain cardiac tamponade. At which site should the needle be inserted to avoid penetrating the lung and pleura? Cardiac tamponade is a serious medical condition in which blood or fluids fill the pericardial space between the visceral and parietal surface layers of pericardium. This produces extreme pressure on the heart and prevents the ventricles from expanding fully and therefore the heart cannot pump enough blood to the rest of the body. When this happens, it results in heart failure, shock, and even death. In order to relieve the pressure, a procedure called pericardiosynthesis is used to obtain fluid from the pericardial cavity. In this technique, a needle is inserted through the thoracic wall into the pericardial cavity. And in order to avoid penetrating the lung and pleura, the surface anatomy should be mapped. Pleura crosses the sternoclavicular joint toward the midline and reaches the midline at the level of the second costal cartilage behind the sternum at the level of the sternal angle and then descends vertically down on the right side until it reaches the level of the sixth costal cartilage where it's going to go around the thoracic wall to cross the eighth rib at the level of the midclavicular line and then the tenth rib at the level of the midaxillary line. However, on the left side, the upper part of the reflections of the pleura are the same as that on the right side. So pleura crosses behind the sternoclavicular joint on the left, reaches the midline at the level of the sternal angle, and then descends down to the level of the fourth costal cartilage where it deviates laterally to the left and then descends about two fingers lateral to the left border of the sternum until it reaches the sixth costal cartilage to pass around the thoracic wall having the same surface anatomical features of that of the right side. Now let's map the heart. The superior border of the heart extends from the inferior margin of the second costal cartilage about three centimeter from the midline to the superior margin of the third costal cartilage to the side of the sternum and from this point to the sixth costal cartilage in a convexity. This marks the right border of the heart. The inferior border can be mapped from here to a point located in the fifth intercostal space almost at the midclavicular line and then the left border continues in a convexity to meet the first point. So this represents the surface anatomy of the heart. Therefore, in order to penetrate the pericardium while avoiding the pleura, the needle could be passed in the fourth or fifth intercostal spaces close to the sternum. At these locations, there is a heart covered by pericardium but not covered by pleura. Therefore, three is the most suitable point. Another option, which is not shown in this question, is to insert a needle just below the xiphy sternum in the left costal xiphoid angle. But in this case, care should be taken to avoid the superior epigastric vessels that descend vertically down the anterior abdominal wall from this location. Which of the following vertebral facets 1 to 3 articulates with the head of the rib of a corresponding number? Name the joint formed at 4. What is its type? 1 is an inferior demi facet half facet on the body of a thoracic vertebra. 2 is a superior demi facet on the body. 3 is a facet on the transverse process. Ribs 1 to 10 articulate by their heads with the bodies of the vertebrae and by their tubercle with the transverse processes of the numerically corresponding vertebra. Therefore, here 3 is excluded because 3 articulates with the tubercle and does not articulate with the head. In ribs 2 to 9, the head is wedge shaped and it carries two articular facets forming Complex joints with the costal facets on the body of thoracic vertebrae, these are called costal vertebral joints, which are plain synovial joints. The inferior facet on the head of the rib articulates with the superior costal facet on the body of a numerically corresponding vertebra, that is two. The other facet on the head is for articulation, the superior facet is for articulation with the inferior facet on the body of the vertebra above. Therefore, facet two is the facet that articulates with the head of the rib of a corresponding 
number. Section B, name the joint form that for. The joint here is between the superior and inferior articular processes of adjacent vertebrae. This is a plain synovial joint and is called the zygopophyseal or facet joint. What is the rib level of fissure 1 and 2? This is the right lung. It has three lobes and two fissures, upper, middle, and lower lobe. And the two fissures are the oblique fissure 2 that divides the organ into separate upper and lower lobes. And one is the horizontal fissure that passes from the anterior margin into the oblique fissure to separate the wedge-shaped middle lobe from the upper lobe. On the surface of the body, the oblique fissure starts at the level of the second thoracic spine posteriorly and follows the medial border of the scapula when the arm is abducted. And then it follows the sixth rib to reach the lower border of the lung at the sixth costochondral junction. The horizontal fissure, number one, on the other hand, extends from the anterior margin of the lung at the level of the fourth costal cartilage and follows the fourth rib to reach the oblique fissure. As for the bronchopulmonary segments, the middle lobe, which is located between the two fissures, it has two bronchopulmonary segments. A bronchopulmonary segment is a wedge-shaped division of the lung that is served by a segmental bronchus and has its own branch of pulmonary artery and the bronchial artery. The tributaries of pulmonary veins are located at the border of adjacent segments. It is important to know about bronchopulmonary segments because disease of the lung, like tumor or abscess, may be limited to one segment or lobe before spreading to another, and the affected segment may surgically be removed without disturbing the surrounding lung tissue. Each lung has 10 segments, 5 in the lower lobe of both right and left lungs, 2 in the middle lobe of the right lung, and 3 in the upper lobe of the right lung. On the left side, the lingula, which represents the middle lobe of the right lung, is part of the upper lobe, thus adding 2 segments to the upper lobe, making it 5 segments in the left upper lobe. Which of the muscles 1, 2, or 3 is the main respiratory muscle? And what is the nerve supply of each of the muscles 1, 2, or 3? This is a posterior view of the anterior body wall showing the posterior aspect of the anterior abdominal wall and the posterior aspect of the anterior thoracic wall. You can see the ribs and the sternum in the middle. Fibers of the diaphragm separating between thoracic and abdominal cavity are indicated by three. This is the costal and the sternal origin of the diaphragm. The diaphragm arises from the inner surface of the lower six ribs. Two is a muscle that extends from the lower third of the posterior surface of the sternum toward the costal cartilages. You can see that this muscle has muscle fibers in different obliquities. This is the transversus thoracis muscle, also referred to as sternocostalis. The muscle indicated by one forms a continuous layer of muscle between the ribs. The fibers are directed downwards and backwards. It is the internal intercostal muscle. Although the internal intercostal muscle is the intermediate layer of intercostal muscles, there is the innermost intercostal deeper to it, but it is shown here as the deepest because the deepest innermost layer, which has the same direction of muscle fibers as that of the internal intercostal, this deepest layer covers the middle two-fourths of the intercostal space. It does not extend anteriorly. These three muscles, they contribute to the respiratory movement, but the diaphragm is the main respiratory muscle. Regarding the nerve supply, the intercostal muscles, whether external, internal, like in one, or innermost, and including the transversus thoracis, number two, are segmentally supplied by intercostal nerves. The diaphragm three is supplied by the phrenic nerve. What tubal structure can be palpated deep to this notch? and identify the muscle indicated by B, what is the number of the costal cartilages between which it is located. A is the jugular notch at the upper border of the manubrium of the sternum. The trachea can be palpated here. It is the most anterior structure and the esophagus lies behind it. Regarding B, the intercostal muscle fibers at this location, they extend from the side of the sternum between the costal cartilages. Note that the muscle fibers are directed downwards and backwards, so they are the same direction as the internal intercostal muscle fibers. You should not 
confuse them with external intercostal muscle fibers whose direction is downwards and forwards. In addition, the external intercostal muscle layer extends from the rib tubercle behind to the costochondral junction anteriorly. Between the costal cartilages from the costochondral junction to the sternum, the external intercostal is replaced by what we call the anterior or external intercostal membrane, which is fibrous tissue and doesn't have muscle fibers. Therefore, you don't expect to find external intercostal muscle fibers between the costal cartilages anteriorly. As for the remaining part of the question about the number of the costal cartilages, in order to count the ribs and costal cartilages, it is better to refer to the sternal angle at the manubrio-sternal joint between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. The costal cartilage that lies lateral to that is the second costal cartilage. So this will be the third and this one will be the fourth costal cartilages. And the space in which these muscle fibers are located in is the third intercostal space. Note that the number of intercostal spaces are counted below the ribs. So the second intercostal space is below the second rib or costal cartilage, the third below the third rib fourth below the fourth rib and so on match the lettered ribs shown in this picture with the following numbered features each feature may be used once twice or not at all a is the first rib while b is the 11th rib you can see that the first rib is almost concealed by the clavicle and its costal cartilage articulates with the manubrium of the sternum the 11th rib is located just above the 12th rib both of them are floating ribs and their costal cartilages do not articulate anteriorly with the sternum. Now let's look at the numbered options. One provides attachment for the diaphragm. The ribs that provide the costal origin of the diaphragm are the lower six ribs. So they include B. Two has a head that articulates with the body of two adjacent vertebrae. Ribs two to nine have a head that articulates with the body of to adjacent vertebrae. So this option does not apply to neither rib A nor rib B. Rib A has a head that articulates with a facet on the first thoracic vertebra and B also articulates only with the 11th thoracic vertebra. Number three has a tubercle for scariness anterior. The tubercle for scariness anterior is a feature on the medial border of the first rib. The first rib provides attachment for the scaliness anterior as well as scaliness medius, while the second rib provides attachment for the scaliness posterior. Note that the second rib has a tuberosity, but not for the scalenes, it is for the serratus anterior muscle. Regarding option four, has a tubercle that articulates with the transverse process of its numerically corresponding vertebra, Ribs 11 and 12, they do not have a tubercle to articulate with a transverse process of a vertebra. They only articulate with the body of the vertebra. But rib A, the first rib, has a tubercle that articulates with the transverse process of T1. The tubercle of the first rib is unique in that it coincides with the angle of the rib. But from this level down, the angle of the rib gradually moves laterally away from the tubercle. Identify the muscle, what is its nerve supply? Identify the structure, what is its origin? This is the inside of the posterior thoracic wall. Note the ribs and the layer of intercostal muscles, which uh, forms the deepest of the layers. It is attached to the inner surfaces of adjacent ribs and is called the innermost intercostal muscle. Note that the intercostal neurovascular bundle disappears as it approaches this layer because the neurovascular plane is located between the middle and innermost layers so it is located between the internal intercostal and the innermost layer also note that this layer does not extend medially toward the vertebral column because this layer is restricted to the middle two-fourths of the intercostal space so it does not extend posteriorly as far as the vertebral column and does not extend anteriorly as far as the sternum as any other intercostal muscle, these fibers are supplied segmentally by intercostal nerves. B is a posterior intercostal artery. Note the posterior intercostal vein here. The neurovascular bundle, the intercostal neurovascular bundle is formed by a vein above, then a, an artery, and then the nerve is the most inferior. So the vein it drains 
into the azygous system of veins. Here it drains into the azygous vein because it is on the right side. The artery, the posterior intercostal artery, is usually most of them, most of the posterior intercostal arteries, lower nine intercostal arteries are branches of the descending thoracic aorta. You cannot see its origin from the aorta because this is the esophagus and the aorta is located on the left side. So it has to cross the midline. This one, which supplies the right side, has to cross the midline and the right posterior intercostal arteries are longer than left posterior intercostal arteries. Thank you.